Welcome back to our module on designing a RISC-V CPU. CPU is a digital system, so based on the fundamental principles of designing digital logic, we should be able to build one. But how do we really go about building a CPU? We have heard about state machines as a common way of describing digital logic, or digital systems, to be more precise. So can we use a state machine to describe the CPU or to design a CPU? It shouldn't be a surprise that the answer is yes. We can view a CPU design as the design of a state machine. Let's uh, think of one instruction and then we can try to extrapolate that to all the instructions that we have in a CPU. So state in a CPU is contained in the registers, the memory, and the program counter. We don't have any other um, part of a CPU that stores, uh, you know, sto stores the data. So that would set what would be combination logic doing. So for example, in this case, if we are doing an addition operation, all relevant contents would be in the instruction memory that we have over here pointed. We wouldn't care much about the contents of a data memory, which is DMEM, but we would care about the registers and the program counter. The contents of the registers and the program counter and the instruction memory would be used to perform the function, to execute that instruction. So if the instruction is a register-based add, then this combinational logic would perform an add based on the contents of the state elements. And the result will be written back into the state elements, into the registers and the memory, and would update the program counter. We can have a different bubble of combinational logic for every instruction. And one can imagine that we could build really a processor that way. You know, every single one of these 30 something instructions in RV32i would have its own dedicated bubble of logic. And then we would essentially use multiplexers um, and the select input on those multiplexers would be a type of instruction that we are executing and we would be updating the state based on these um, different outputs of the, these different combinational logic blocks. But that's not practical because many instructions are going to share the same data path. So in general, we are going to try to build this data path as a cloud of logic that can execute all the instructions. So the instruction would, would start executing on a tick of a clock, on a rising edge of a clock, go through the combinational logic and present the outputs of it back to the state elements. On the next click tick of a clock, on the next rising edge of a clock, we'll write it back as a new state in the state elements. We'll keep doing that. We, by doing that sequence, we would execute all instructions that we have. Now, Building one monolithic cloud of logic that would be executing all instructions is also not practical. Um, it's really hard to think of it that way. It is hard to, to, to um, design that kind of a logic. There is just too much stuff going on in there. So a general solution to that is to break up instruction execution into phases and have a bubble of logic associated with each of these phases. It's a lot easier to divide and conquer this, particularly given the fact that all instructions have similar phases. Not all of them have all the phases of execution, but most of all of them have at least some phases of that execution. So you know, to actually see what, that, what am I talking about, let's take a look at common phases of exec execution um, that would correspond to separate stages in a data path. So stage one would be instruction fetch, stage two is instruction decode, stage three is execute, stage four is memory access, and stage five is write back to registers. What does this mean? 
we're going to see it in a much more detail uh, a bit later, but I'll just give you a quick preview for now. Instruction fetch gets the instruction from the memory and um, stores it in the processor. Then instruction decode looks at that process, that, that instruction, and determines what it is. So decodes what is the operation that we would like to do. In the execution stage, we actually perform the operation. Um, commonly that may be done by the arithmetic logic unit. And we'll find out that we are using arithmetic logic unit not just for um, calculating arithmetic and logic operations, whether they're register or, or immediate based, uh, but also for branches. Then in the fourth phase, we would access the memory. If we are doing any of these instructions that have to deal with the memory, we would access the memory in the fourth stage. These are loads and stores. And finally, in the fifth stage, if we need to write back the content in, in the registers, like for example, in case of loads, we would complete this instruction in the fifth stage by writing back to the register. Let's take a look at schematically how does this look like. So here is a diagram of a data path for a processor. It's a very generic data path and it is shown here arranged um, are the, the elements that we have seen before, we have heard before, but we haven't seen them really connected in a particular way. Um, in the first stage, we have a program counter. Then there is an instruction memory. There is a register file, ALU, and the data memory. And in this case, we are assuming that we have two separate memories, instruction memory and the data memory, although they're a part of one physical memory, but we are assuming that we are separately treating that part of a memory that contains instructions from a part of a memory that contains the data. We'll see later uh, why do we do that and how do we do that. So, um, just to, to get a little bit about uh, insight of what is going on in here um, around there is some logic around the program counter so the program counter in um, when it is executing instructions in sequence will be incremented by four bytes to point to the next array to bit word in risk 5 this mux here is to bypass that increment and write a branch target if the branch is to be taken. Um, in that way, the program counter would be pointing to the instruction where the branch lands. Then we have an instruction memory that um, has instructions in there, and these instructions will um, point to the registers that you would like to, to work with. So it would issue addresses um, that correspond to the destination register or first and second source registers. Finally, we have the ALU and the data memory. And from the data memory, there is this path where we write back to the registers. Let's take a look at the phases of execution um, and they're executed in sequence from the first one to the fifth one. Ex instruction fetch happens by the program counter pointing to the instruction memory. That is all what it is about the fetch. Instruction pointer points to an allocation in the instruction memory where the next instruction is. That's how we fetch the instruction. Then when you have that instruction, um, we decode it. Um, often that phase is associated with the register read because at the same time we know that our, our formats of the instructions are rigid and particular parts of the instructions are going to be used as addresses to the register file. In the third phase or stage of uh, execution, we will execute. Um, we will perform addition or subtraction or branch calculation. Then we will access the memory by um, using the result of the ALU. And then finally, the result 
of the, 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 the result of the memory access will be written back into the register file. We're going to see this in much more detail in many, many examples for every single one of the instructions or instruction types that we have introduced previously. For now, it is important to also understand this concept of a single cycle data path. So all of these five phases of execution are going to happen during one clock cycle. So on a, we are going to start instruction execution on the first rising edge of a clock with the instruction fetch. And we are going to write back the final result on the next rising edge of a clock. So that at that point, the registers will be updated and the program counter will be updated to contain the new address of the next instruction to be fetched. Later on, we'll find out that we can break this up into multiple clock cycles, but all of our discussion for the next few segments is going to be dealing with this, what we call a single cycle data path, where all five phases of execution happen within one clock cycle. So how do we build the data path then? We have seen some of these elements. Um, here are the components that we need. We, they're all familiar. We have all seen them in the module on digital systems. So combinatorial elements that we have um, are uh, adders, multiplexers, and ALUs um, that will be arranged like Legos. That's why this is so fun, because we can do it essentially as assembling a Lego kit. And then we need to complement them with uh, state elements, which are the elements that store the data and the clocking methodology. And for now, we are sticking with a very simple clocking methodology that corresponds to a single cycle CPU. Let's talk a little, talk a little bit about these state elements. The first one that we'll definitely need is a register. This register is, again, a fairly simple structure, and we have seen it before. It's a collection of flip-flops, if you will. Um, so a 32-bit register will consist of 32 flip-flops, and they're all going to be written together on a rising edge of a clock. So in this case, we have data in, port into that register, and data out, port in that register. We are labeling it as having a port that is n bits wide. You know, what does that mean? Well, it is a shorthand notation for having n wires, and most commonly in 32-bit data paths, that number n is going to be 32. So we have data port that is 32 wires wide into the register, and data out port that is also 32 bits, bits wide. The register gets updated only on the rising edge of a clock. So the new value gets writ written on the rising edge of the clock if the write enable signal is asserted. If the, the write enable signal is not asserted, if it is deasserted, if it is equal to zero, the, the, the values in the register will not change. So let's recap that one more time. We will change the values of the data on the port or bus data in. On the rising edge of a clock, that new value, those new values will be written into the register and they will stay at the output of that register until the next clock cycle. And that's it. The next thing, the next building block in this hierarchy is the register file. Register file is a collection of registers. So a register is a collection of flip-flops. Register file is a collection of, of registers. So in um, RV32i, we need a register file with 32 registers to hold all the registers that we need uh, for our architecture. One thing to keep in mind that there is a limitation on how many registers we can access at a time. Um, the wires, 
you know, when you get to the really nitty gritty details of how we implement processors, we'll find out that wires are a real challenge to fit to access in any possible order these registers. In the architecture of RISC-V requires that we should be able to read two registers simultaneously out of a register file and that we can write to one of these registers. So, um, in short, this would be called to read single write type of a register file. To read single write. The way how we access the register file is again by using the addresses and the buses. There is one input bus that contains the new value that is going to be written in it and it is in RISC-V RV32I 32, 32 bits wide. And there are two output buses, bus A and bus B, that will contain um, the, the values that are in registers A and B or source registers 1 and 2. The way how we select which one of these two uh, which of the 32 registers would put their data out on the bus A or bus B is by setting their addresses at these ports RA and RB. So, um, so when we select, when we put a 5-bit number that corresponds to a 5-bit address of any of the 32 registers on RA, we are going to get the contents of that register on the bus A and correspondingly when we put an address of a register on uh, port RB we are going to get its contents on the output RB. When we would like to write to a register we need to enable it for writing. We don't want to scribble over the registers accidentally so we have to say that we mean it by asserting the write enable by putting the datum on the bus W setting the address of the register that we would like to write into on RW and on the rising edge of a clock this value from bus W is going to be transferred to the corresponding register. This is kind of a, a bit of a magic register file. Um, we need only clock to write into it well, we assume that every time we just assert the when, when as soon as we put the va values RA and RB um, at its inputs at the at its uh, at its uh, address inputs, the outputs are going to show up. So we don't need a clock in order to read the register file. There is of course some delay um, until these outputs show up. We call that the access time. Then there are more um, state elements, elements that contain the state. So we, ha so we have a memory, and memory is again fairly magical. Um, we have data in bus and data out bus and the address. We also have a clock and write enable that work very similarly to what we have had before. So um, in this case we have multiplexed read and write access to the memory. What does that mean? when we put an address here we and don't clock it the data will magically that corresponds to that address show up at the data out bus when we would like to write into the memory we will assert the write enable and on the next rising edge of a clock data in will be written into a corresponding memory location where the address corresponds to Again, there are delays associated with reading and writing the memories, which we'll call read and write access times when needed. So, let's recap. What is the state that is required by the RV32I ISA? Each instruction um, during execution reads and updates the state of three sets of elements, the registers, the program counter and the memory. So registers um, or the register file holds 32 registers each being of 32 bits wide 
um, meaning that we have 1024 total flip-flops that are organized in 32 registers where each of these 32 registers is 32 bits wide. The first register that we would like to address, uh, address or work with is specified uh, by the RS1 field in the instruction. The second register that we would like to read from is specified by the RS2 field. So we have two read ports. The right register or the destination where we would like to write the result to is specified by the RD field in the instruction. And we know that X0 register is essentially a zero. So we actually don't need to have flip-flops in that row of the register file. We can just um, connect all of those to zero. We'll be anyways ignoring any request to write there. The next one, uh, the next state element is the program counter. It's also a 32-bit register that holds the address of the current instruction that we are executing. And we are going to update it during the execution of every instruction to point to the next instruction that we'll be executing, whether it's the next instruction in sequence, which is four bytes away, or the target of a branch. Finally, we have memory. And we hinted that we, when we are designing memory, it's a monolithic piece where we store both the data and the program. But for the purpose of designing a data path, we break it up into two parts, the instruction memory and the data memory. There's still a part of the same physical memory, but in all of our drawings, we are going to treat it separately. And we'll see a little bit later in just um, the next module that we enable that by using some pieces, uh, a concept called caches. We'll have separate instruction and data caches which hold the copies of the corresponding parts of the main memory, but will be on-chip and fast to access. We are not going to discuss that for now. We'll just imagine that we have two separate memories. Um, so instructions are read uh, or fetched from the instruction memory, which we'll call IMEM, and load and store instructions access the data memory, which is the DMEM. So we are now ready to actually build our first instruction. We'll do that after the break.